afternoon and welcome to another in our series of webinars by the Center for Environmental Policy at the School of Public Affairs at American University. Today, as part of our ongoing series on ideas, interests, institutions, and nation state climate politics, we are going to talk about politics in our own backyard. We have several specialists here who are experts on climate policy in the United States. And the title is Reluctant or Inconsistent Engagement. We're going to start off with uh, a feature presentation by our own director of the Center for Environmental Policy and a professor of public administration here in the School of Public Affairs, Dan Fiorino. After uh, Dan's presentation, we're going to have a couple of discussants. One of them is Dorothy Daly, who's a professor uh, at the School of Public Affairs and Administration at the University of Kansas, and also an expert on US climate policy. And then we will hear from uh, another discussant, Stephen Harper, who's the Global Director of uh, Energy and Environment Policy for Intel. So we look forward to that presentation. Uh, as we proceed, if you have questions, please place them in the Q&A area uh, in, in Zoom. We will hope to get to some of those after our speakers. And the last thing I wanna do before starting is just remind you that we have several more presentations in this series. Most of them or all of them are gonna be in early to mid-May. Our next one is May 10th. We'll be talking about the global adaptation regime, building resilience for an uncertain future. Uh, that uh, webinar will be led by Thomas Oatley of Tulane University, and will also feature other speakers um, with expertise around the world. So um, now let's come back closer to home and introduce please uh, Professor Dan Fiorino. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, it's, it's great to be here today to talk about these issues. And thank you, Todd, also for um, the excellent series that you've organized that has really allowed us all to explore a number of issues in climate policy. So I want to give a little perspective on, on the United States. Um, I'm I'm not saying that the U.S. is not a reluctant mitigator, because there is certainly evidence of that. But I, I think if we, we look a little deeper, it may be very helpful to say the United States is an inconsistent mitigator, both over time with clear changes in different administrations, but especially among the American states. So I'll get into some of those differences. So um, what I want to do is um, just very briefly uh, give a quick history of U.S. climate mitigation, just to um, make the point that we have had a fair degree of inconsistency over time. Uh, then look at how the U.S. compares to other countries very briefly, but then um, talk more about variation at, at levels of government, mainly variation among the American states. So we, we have you know, a third to about half of the states that have pretty active <clears throat> climate mitigation. And I'll touch to some degree on adaptation as well, policies and a number of others that don't and give you a few performance indicators. And then using the um, interest institutions and ideas framework, which actually works pretty nicely for the United States at a general level, look at some of the explanations for this inconsistency and, and the prospects for the United States. So um, if we think about the history of climate policy, that this is, a, I broke it into five periods. And I think if we go back to the 1980s and certainly there was scientific evidence about climate change and the effects of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But um, I think it was really in the mid 1980s that the issue started to take a place on the policy agenda. So I'll, I'll start there. I think that 1988 was the year that James Hansen gave his 
famous testimony on the threat of climate change. Um, so climate emerged on the policy agenda. Um, we had the period of the Clinton-Gore administration, Al Gore notably, of course, known for his uh, climate ambitions. We had the, the uh, Bird hagel vote in the Senate. <clears throat> um, and the US was unable to ratify or commit to Kyoto. Then we had a period under the uh, George W. Bush administration <clears throat> of not complete lack of progress because there was some energy legislation that moved in the right direction, but certainly <laughs> um, not clear climate action to get at the causes of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then um, the Obama administration, I call taking the issue seriously. Of course, we had the uh, Waxman-Markey effort, which did pass the House, but not the Senate. Um, a number of administrative and regulatory efforts, I think probably the agreement with China in 2014, which helped pave the way to the Paris Agreement were some of the biggest accomplishments, that and the Clean Power Plan, which then of course got tied up um, legally. Um, and then a what I call populist regression uh, under the Trump administration, just a dramatic reversal of the Obama climate agenda, the Obama agenda in general. Withdrawal from Paris is certainly a powerful symbolic move as well as practical move. Um, reversals of a number of policies, everything from um, auto efficiency to at least efforts to um, do away with a lot of the appliance, lighting, other kinds of efficiency. So US policy and, and commitment internationally, certainly um, a period of regression. And now we're in, in a period of, of re-engaging re at home and abroad. So rejoining Paris and um, trying to push through a legislative agenda as well as a regulatory administrative agenda. So one uh, doesn't will not find a period of sort of sustained commitment and progress. I think just a lot of moving back and forth and thus um, use of consistency. If we look, I'll just look very briefly at how the US uh, fares in one of the uh, major international climate assessments is the Climate Change Performance Index, which comes out regularly. It's a you know, pretty thorough job to look at trends in emissions and commitment to renewable energy. There's certainly other assessments out there, but in, in this particular one, because <laughs> it includes um, about 20% of the assessment is based on policy indicators. Uh, the US did not fare well in the 2021 version. So this shows you the top 10 countries, Sweden, um, probably you know, among prosperous countries, the country that's, that has the most committed policies, United Kingdom, very strong and so on. And then if we look at the bottom 10 countries, uh, the CCPI put the United States at the very bottom um, some other uh, assessments are not are not quite so negative, but in this one, certainly, uh, in terms of trends in greenhouse gas emissions, ranked rated very low in renewable energy, low, that was the relatively better one, energy use very low, and then po public policy at the very bottom, uh, reflecting the, the Trump years. So the U.S. does not fare well. There's an... Um, you know, the Environmental Performance Index done by Yale and Columbia Universities was a little more positive, but I don't think anyone um, certainly would claim that the U.S. is um, a leader in, in climate mitigation. Um, it's actually a fairly middling and I would say very inconsistent record. But I thought we, we can look a little more in depth at how different countries are doing. So um, the first column with the numbers has greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalent 
These are gigatons, billions of tons. The percentage related to energy, because when I did this, I was very interested in the effects of the energy system per capita em emissions and then um, carbon in intensity, uh, tons of emissions per million dollars of gross domestic product. And if you look at this, <clears throat> like most developed countries, um, the US. Um, most of its emissions are product of the energy system, so it shows the need to transform the energy system. But if, if you look at the far right um, row, the, you know, the U.S. is a reasonably <clears throat> efficient economy. It's a rich country, so it's going to have pretty high emissions. But you look at that per capita emissions, that's really where the U.S. Um, does not compare well at all. Um, a few other countries, I think Canada and Australia, which aren't here, would not perform particularly well. But, you know, some fairly prosperous countries, uh, the UK, Sweden, um, are able to perform pretty well on that indicator. So that's mainly, of course, a product of our transportation system. And um, this just shows how emissions have been trending since 2005 which is an important year in terms of the Paris commitments. So you see the green line um, where we've made progress to the extent that emissions have gone down. It's in um, the elect electricity, power generation, where uh, the rise of natural gas to replace coal has lowered emissions, still a fossil fuel, but less climate intensive. And then um, some growth in renewables. Renewables are growing at a very rapid rate, certainly, but starting from a, a very low start. Um, so it will take some a while for that to play in. But generally, um, all the clean energy scenarios say you, you clean up the power system, then you electrify as much end use as you can. You really push hard on efficiency, and that's where you make progress. But again, buildings, pretty stable. Industry, pretty flat. Transportation um, on, fell during the pandemic, but um, resuming its old pattern. This, I just wanted to give a sense of um, how, how things look for the, the next decade or so. So the Biden administration um, has uh, adopted a goal and made this part of the our commitments under Paris to um, reduce emissions overall by 50 to 52% below 2005 levels. So you see the, the, the blue area sort of shows a couple of some, some range of a high emission scenario and a lower emission scenario. If we extend out based on current policy, we, we could get halfway <laughs> to that goal. Um, this, I don't know I, I, if this fully incorporates all of the infrastructure bill. So, you know, it could be in the higher end of that current policy range. But even if it is, that's still a, a couple of billion tons of emissions um, where we're falling short. So the Rodian Group, which does some very nice um, assessments of directions based on the Energy Information Administration data uh, did a report uh, last year on uh, last fall, Pathways to Paris, and this reflects their assessment. So to really get to the, the Paris goal of a, you know, cutting emissions by 50% by 2030, um, we still have quite a gap. So they lay out a joint action scenario, which lays out of some additional measures um, and, and assumes that it, its state and corporate sector will see a lot of progress. So um, as things stand now, um, I think the current policy is a little more how things look. So here I wanted to just take a look at what's happening at the state level. And these are um, just um, energy related emissions, but they're over 80%. Um, and they're from the, the Energy Information Administration. They, they're from 2016. I haven't found 
something more recent, I need to do more looking. But this, the, you, know, you, you take a look at this and you see considerable variation among, among the American states. So per capita emissions in the US in 2016 from energy were about 16 tons per person. <clears throat> you see some states, California, Massachusetts, the first five states listed that were, were well below that level. And then you see a number of other states that were well above that level. Um, they tend to be fossil fuel producing states. Um, Indiana, not so much, but um, relies very heavily <clears throat> on coal for electricity. Uh, if you look at emissions intensity per million dollars of um, gross state product, again, you, you see pretty substantial differences. So states like California, Maryland, Massachusetts in the mid 100s uh, and other states much, much higher. And then I will return to this later, but um, part of what we're trying to do in, the, in this series is look at the connections between mitigation and adaptation. And um, I'll return to this, but Climate Central, working with uh, ICF, the consulting firm, did an assessment of preparedness for um, adaptation in the states. And I thought it was sort of interesting that um, some of the states that are doing well on mitigation also tend to do well on um, this, this assessment. And I haven't really independently evaluated it, but it's, so it's just suggestive. And then I threw in out of curiosity, because there's a very clear ideological pattern in what we're seeing at the state level, um, where more democratic liberal states, there tends to be a pretty strong <laughs> pro-climate action coalition. And in, uh, in more conservative states, we see the reverse. So I just put that out there. We can talk about that later if we want. So let me just quickly apply this interest institutions ideas framework and see how it helps explain um, the US and, and perhaps our prospects. So um, this is a, was applied in an article by Lam and Minx from a few years ago. It's based on a framework that's been around for a while. So it says that if, if you look at barriers to climate action at a national level, and here I'm, I'm talking at the national level in the United States, we can think in terms of interest institutions and ideas. So with interest, we have the competition among various interest groups that have a stake in the outcome. So of course, in the United States, as well as in Canada, Australia, and some other countries, pretty substantial uh, fossil fuel interests with a high degree of political power, opposing that are environmental and, and growing our clean energy interests. So that, that is something to consider. Institutions look at both the quality of institutions and then um, sort of the features, the, 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 the number of veto points in a system, the effects of different political cycles and so on. And then ideas, underlying worldviews and ideologies of different actors. And the United States, um, say a you know preference for the status quo, suspicion of maybe government authority, a few other things that I'll get into. But something I think is significant is a, a growing um, distrust of science and of elites that we see in the political culture. And I think that's starting to have some pretty significant effects. So here I just summarize the interests factor. Um, generally, the uh, states that are, are not doing much and that don't perform well in, in mitigation terms and perhaps in adaptation terms have very strong fossil fuel industries and other states don't. California has, has oil, has fossil, some fossil fuels, but it's also a very large diverse economy. So that's not a powerful set of interests. So certainly if you look at interests um, right now, I think there's some explanatory value looking at the state level. There have been uh, empirical studies that 
um, have found that to be the, the, the sort of the size, the influence of the fossil fuel industry to be important, both at a national level and in the American states. So there is some empirical support as well as what is fairly obvious. Institutionally, we, of course, the United States has a system that's designed to um, disperse rather than concentrate power. So there was a very nice uh, research article um, seven or eight years ago by Nathan Madden, in, I think in environmental politics, and looked at the number of veto points, he called them veto players, in a system at a national level and found that the more veto players, um, the fewer climate policies and the less stringent were those climate policies. So there's some general support. Um, we of course have a system with all kinds of veto points, separation of powers, judicial review, the supermajority requirement in the Senate for treaty ratification and so on. Federalism, um, is a veto point. This, this may be something that is a, sort of a positive from a climate mitigation perspective. Um, something to watch in the uh, next couple of months is um, where the courts will go. The, the Massachusetts versus EPA decision in 2007 at least created the potential for um, progress on mitigation. Um, now with a different kind of Supreme Court. Uh, something to watch is this West Virginia versus EPA case, which could um, limit EPA and other agencies' ability to sort of creatively use their statutes. Of course, the Senate rules require supermajorities. Um, filibuster still exists for certain for substantive legislation. Um, also, we, we, we hear about this, so I looked a little into it. Um, the composition of the Senate, of course, lately uh, tends to favor rural states. So um, an analysis by 538.com suggests Democrats need a generic vote majority of six to 7% in the Senate and a two to 5% in the House just to get a majority in those two branches of the legislature. So, um, if you take sort of all the, the veto points and all the checks and balances, and if you uh, throw in some bias in representation, um, you, you see that there are some pretty substantial barriers to national action on climate mitigation. On ideas, I've touched upon this, but um, I think our political culture, we've had a dominance of neoliberal policies for the past three decades, four decades, um, sharply polarized public opinion on climate change. It's really quite astounding. I didn't want to take the time, but um, very diverging based on partisan affiliation. Also, the um, we're seeing a, an ascendance of right-wing populist sentiment in the United States and part of that is a distrust of expertise and climate science and a, and a suspicion of, of international influence of various kinds. Those are two very strong characteristics of right-wing populism. So this combines with the interest and in institutional factors to block climate action at national level. So this is simply my summary slide. Um, which I think I really touched upon. Um, I have been, this is just sort of thinking out loud at this point. Um, Todd and I want to discuss this further because this uh, series and a book coming out of it, we are interested in the connections or lack thereof between mitigation and adaptation. So here I just try and lay out what I think are some of the differences between mitigation and adaptation. Uh, mainly, you, you can free ride on, on other um, jurisdictions, other countries, other corporations, uh, mitigation efforts. It's awfully hard when you, know, the, you, you have flooding or extreme heat or other sorts of immediate impacts <clears throat> to ignore those kinds of things. However, what 
this doesn't reflect is sort of longer term climate resilience. Well, one of my students called in a in my class climate proofing. I thought that was an interesting term where you actually prepare, you don't just have to respond sort of to things as they emerge, but you build in resiliency. So here, this is very speculative, but let me just throw this out. Um, climate Central and ICF <clears throat> did a report um, in 2015, I ran across this, and I haven't really looked at the methodology, but I'll assume it's at least enough to speculate on at this point. And they um, compared states on five different kinds of um, climate impacts uh, to coastal flooding, inland flooding, uh, extreme heat, um, wildfires, and one other one and um, gave grades. They gave grades in each of those specific categories, but an overall grade. And sort of interesting to look at this, um, you know, if you just sort of eyeball this and maybe you know, I'll have somebody do a more systematic analysis, but states that mostly seem to do better on mitigation and, um, do seem to do better in this assessment and states that do poorly do less well. So at least this suggests that maybe there's something about state ideology or state political administrative capacity that um, may help us predict um, the connect, some of the connections between mitigation and adaptation. So just to wrap up, um, yes, the US is a reluctant mitigator, but it may be very helpful to say it's an inconsistent mitigator. Um, there's been some incremental progress, but well, well short of the needed reductions to, to meet um, obligations under the Paris Agreement and really sort of contribute to this um, process of reducing emissions. Um, one third of about one half of the states, depending on how you count them, are really carrying the mitigation load. The other states are free riding, at least on the mitigation side. Um, the politics of mitigation and adaptation are different, but we really need to think more about that and um, strategic adaptation, that is building longer term resilience, could reflect aspects of state ideology and state administrative capacity. So with that, I will turn um, the floor back over to Todd. Thank you for letting me present this. Many thanks, Dan, for your lucid presentation of some of the shortcomings of US climate policy. Uh, before we open up for discussion, let us please hear from our two discussants, starting with uh, Professor Dorothy Daly of the School of Public Affairs and Administration at the University of Kansas. And thank you for joining us very much. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, Dan, for that presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just want to confirm technologically you can it seems like we're a go you can all hear me um thank you so uh, uh dan your presentation was fantastic and um i think your assessment of, of sort of the nuance of um reluctant versus inconsistent is spot on. And even within the, um, the sort of inconsistency at the federal level, at least what I see through my own work and, and even in your presentation, is that there's some consistency at the subnational level in that it's certain states that are the leaders. And this is actually um, true across a variety of policy areas, not just environmental policy. Um, and as I was reflecting on this, one of the things that keeps coming to my head as I grapple with my own research on climate change and, and subnational activity in climate change um, is the emerging literature on the, the 
rollback of the regulatory state. And what we're seeing across all policy areas is a set of, a set of states that have poor, health, poor outcomes around health, climate, other environmental markers. Um, and, I, and, and at least as I reflect on this, um, the ideas, institutions, and what was the I, I, oh, I was taking notes here. Um, the interest, ideas, and institutions framework seems very prominent to think through some of the explanatory uh, forces pushing us with respect to climate policy. Um, I will also agree with you that I think adaptation and mitigation are two, they're related, but they're two different issues. Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at uh, in the literature includes all of the ways that stealth adaptation is happening that gets around, that does this end run around um, some of the divisive politics of climate change. And um, of course that runs into a hard wall uh, in, in some areas when it's, it, it is still using the public sector as an avenue for change. So I do think there's this broader challenge of what's the role of government and what's the role of government with respect to climate change, climate mitigation, climate adaptation. Um, I'll also say, I struggle a little bit with the literature on subnational climate policy. And I've worked in this area. And, and I think one of the things that um, collectively we as researchers and decision makers could really benefit from is more, more in-depth examination of not just the policies that are passed, because those certainly are a signal and they matter, but I think Dan's presentation really highlighted the complexity of American federalism. A, past, a policy that's passed is only as good as the implementation of that policy. And I think there are so many opportunities for policy implementation to be slowed down. Um, and in particular, when you have concentrated concentrated interests that will bear some of the costs of curbing uh, emissions or adapting to climate change. Although certainly the mitigation part, when we're thinking through electricity, transportation, even the manufacturing of substances, those concentrated inter in interests can really be an effective veto for a well-crafted policy. Um, and so I think that's that's something uh, as we go through and think about the promise of subnational policies in addressing climate mitigation. And there's a lot of forecasting on the promise of state, local, and private sectors in acting, even without the federal government. Those estimates are only as good as the policy implementation on the ground. And that strikes me as still an open, an open question um, with a lot of opportunity for, uh, for drift or, or delay. Um, I'm mindful of time and I, I want to provide our other discussant an opportunity to, to talk about Dan's presentation. And I, I'd welcome the opportunity too to, to have questions um, at the end of the, the webinar as well. So I can end there, I circle back later if there's time and chat more, but um, I'm happy to, to turn it over. Great, thanks, thanks Dorothy uh, for this bringing, raising to the fore this question of, of federalism and, in, and sort of implementation at the subnational level, which I, hope and expect we'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, for now, let's move on to hear from uh, Stephen Harper, who is the Global Director for Environment and Energy Policy uh, at the Intel Corporation, and also a member of the Center for Environmental Policy's Advisory Board. 
Thank you very much, Stephen, for joining us. Thank you, Todd. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me, Todd? Okay, super. Uh, thanks very much, both uh, Todd to yourself as well as 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 Dan and and Dorothy. Uh, I'm going to make a few statements that hopefully will be provocative and spur further discussion. Um, but I'm I'm not trying to be um, purposely purposely. Hang on, let me turn off my phone. Um, not trying to be purposely uh, provocative, but I do think there's some interesting topics here that we could pursue. Uh, I agree with Dorothy uh, that Dan got it right in saying uh, the U.S. is both reluctant but mostly inconsistent. Um, and um, I think that um, there are a lot of reasons for that, in my view. Um, one of the reasons, I think, for reluctance uh, and, and clearly the inconsistency has a partisan uh, rhythm to it uh, as the pendulum swings back and forth. Uh, but I think, you know, our government in general is not only designed to be um, somewhat of a log jam as, as Dan alluded to, but certainly the politics of the moment show that uh, people say, well, the nation is very divided. I actually think, uh, you know, we're proving to be a very centrist country um, and more so than the division, the division is on the, the extremes. I think there's just a lot of moderation in the middle. And I think one of the reasons why folks are reluctant on climate change and policy is because it's been shown to require government action. You know, it's a big problem. It's a big naughty problem that requires big government solutions in the eyes of many. And we're at a period of time where trust and uh, confidence in the ability of governments to do anything uh, competently um, is at a very low ebb. And I just cite the fact that there are still funds that have not been spent from the 2009 Recovery Act. You know, <laughs> the government can't get money out. There's money still unspent from the recovery programs that were put in place in 2021. Um, you would think spending money which gains um, political uh, kudos would be something the government would be very good at. Governments just have not shown themselves to be very competent. And I, and I think uh, the environmentalists and the Democrats um, have made an error in overemphasizing climate change as a crisis. And I clearly, I, I believe it is a crisis. Um, you know, my personal politics are generally left of center. Uh, for what that's worth. So my criticisms here are of my own fellow travelers. But I, I think there's been an overemphasis on the crisis portion of climate change versus the opportunity aspect. Uh, and, you know, people hear about how big a crisis it, is, a crisis it is, the tendency is to throw up your hands and say, you know, it, it's in the hands of God, there's nothing we can do. Um, and I think as much as the Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's movie, was a seminal contribution to raising people's uh, awareness of the problem. I, I think it did some damage, uh, both because of his partisan affiliation and because the overwhelmingly negative, um, you know, import of that film to many people. Uh, now, on the positive side, and again, I didn't have a chance to pull up the specific polls, but my uh, impression from reading over the last four or five years is that notwithstanding division over climate change, there are more people now than before across the spectrum who view climate change as real and climate change is partly human caused. Um, and I think part of that is due to the fact that it's now becoming more personal. Um, and there's an analog here, personal in the sense that people are experiencing particularly bad weather, bad droughts, um, and they're starting to make the connection as it affects their own lives. It's not just something on the news that happens in some other part of the world. And I think that there is a, a corollary here or a, a, a precedent. Um, in the distant past, I've seen polling around the issue of gay marriage. And it turns out over a fairly short period of time, the number of Americans who supported gays' right to marry went up dramatically over time and not over a particularly long time. And some of the analysts of that data have suggested it's because people realized it touched their lives personally. 
you know, they had a loved one or family member, a uh, colleague who was affected by it. It wasn't just some abstract issue. So I think personal impact um, is, is important on the positive side. Um, the climate change performance index, uh, Dan, that you presented seems to me a little flawed and I'd love to take a look at the details. Uh, it's unclear whether that was a one year uh, snapshot <clears throat> but I think um, I think it's inconsistent with actual emission reduction trends. Again, I didn't have a chance over over the week to go back and pull out the data, but I've seen data that shows, and it depends on what time frame you pick. Clearly, that uh, the greater emission reductions over the last 20 years in the United States than climate emission reductions than in Europe. Um, and uh, assuming that's true, or there's some equivalence uh, between the two, um, you know what, what's causing that? Natural gas has been essential, the rise of renewables, and very importantly, state policies. A lot of the assessments, and I don't know whether the, this particular performance index looked at subnational, but I, I remember going to many of the UN climate cops and hearing people talk about there's nothing happening in, in the United States on climate policy. And yet when you present to them what was happening at the state level, and granted it's somewhat partisanly skewed, there's still a tremendous amount of stuff that has happened at the state level. And on top of it, there's been a ton of corporate commitments um, that have added to real emission reductions, at least in, in the recent past. Um, so I think there's a danger in looking just at the federal level and judging that as comprising U.S. action. Um, I got to put on my reading glasses here so I can read my notes. Um, I think that um, obviously um, there is um, a good deal of swinging of the pendulum, and uh, that's a very, very frustrating thing. I think for people outside the United States to watch, it's a very frustrating thing for people like ourselves who care about the issue, but it is what it is. And we kind of have to recognize that in the current uh, situation, although Democrats are nominally in charge, you know, Joe Manchin is essentially president. And, um, you know, there is essentially a Republican Congress and that's gonna make it difficult, at least on the Senate side to get anything done. And it's probably gonna get more Republican um, in the, um, the next election cycle. Uh, several people, and Dan mentioned growing skepticism of science. Um, that's an interesting issue for me. It's not, I think there's skepticism across the political spectrum, but it tends to be issue by issue. Um, I have uh, a number of liberal relatives and in-laws um, who are gung-ho for climate science, as well they should be but who believe that GMOs are, are evil and are bad for you and believe that electric magnetic fields uh, like cell phones cause brain cancer. The science on both of those issues has been clear for many, many years, in fact, decades in the case of EMFs. And yet conservatives tend not to believe climate science, liberals, many of them tend not to believe science that goes against their inerrant prejudices um, and I just think that's a factor of, of, human, uh, of, of human nature. So I don't think either side is particularly uh, pure in terms of believing in science. A uh, couple of final things. I think it's important to point out that um, right now, you know, who knows whether Build Back Better climate provisions will pass. Hopefully they will in reconciliation, if not sooner. Uh, but there's an important thing that's going on that was alluded to by, by Dan when he talked about the conservative Supreme Court. And, and that's really happening at the lower court level, which many of the lower courts are even more conservative than the Supreme Court, thanks to President Trump. Um, there's a thing called the Chevron Doctrine, which uh, many people may know or may not know. But it goes back many years, and it's been the practice of the courts to give deference to executive agencies in their regulatory judgments if they go through a sound analytical process and notice and comment. Increasingly conservative justices at the appeals level are throwing out rules that EPA or other agencies have gone through uh, where they think they are beyond the mandate given to the agency by Congress. The Chevron rule, if it is, uh, if it is uh, 
upended um, is is going to take away executive action as you know the last resort of climate policy progress, and that I think is almost more important than what happens with congressional margins. Um, finally, two observations. One, we haven't talked about the international scene at all. There's a very important interrelationship between progress in the in the domestic uh, domestic scene on climate change and our international credibility in the Paris process. Uh, and, and it's true for us and it's true for China, the two biggest emitters. The US and China, both in the last COP and certainly before Paris, came together, uh, signed some agreements and made uh, international negotiation progress possible. And so that's a positive thing, but both countries um, have been backtracking a bit or not making progress. China has sent very confusing messages regarding its dependence on coal. Uh, and I think that um, that interaction for both China and the United States harms our credibility and our ability to move things forward internationally. Um, finally, one last comment. Uh, we just made two weeks ago an announcement of a net zero commitment by 2040. Um, and there's some interim goals that we agreed to by then. We don't know quite how we're going to get there because we're not a big emitter, um, uh, but we do have emissions and we're growing very fast. Um, and we're investing $40 billion this year in new plant capacity and more in the next two years. Uh, so how do we get to net zero if we're already emitting and we're growing? Um, we're working on that. We feel confident we can get there. But every big company in the country, it seems, is committing to net zero. And the net implies offsets. And I often think to myself, how does the math work out? If all these companies are going to net zero, where are all the offsets going to come from? Um, and part of the answer to that question depends on government policy. So here's where the importance of government policy at the state and federal level to complement and support actions by individual companies, that interrelationship is critical. It's not just about how the policies themselves directly affect uh, emissions, it's the interplay of the two. With that, I will turn it back to Todd. Thank you. You're on, you're on mute, Todd. Oh, am I still on mute? Nope. No. Okay. Uh, thank you for those important comments also about a range of issues. Um, ending with the question of public-private uh, collaboration and how to uh, help ensure that, you know, the private sector's push to net zero can actually be, um, can become real through some government action as well as through action by the private sector. So thank you. Uh, we want to open the, the floor. Um, the question that has come in so far uh, seems to relate to uh, whether Dan will share his slides, which indeed are very coveted slides, um, it was very thorough, very analytical as always. And I guess I guess the, the initial statement to that is that, um, that the entire presentation will be available for anyone wishing to, uh, to see it at the center's website, uh, a YouTube video is being made of the presentation and will be available within about a week. And I guess just before we get into the Q&A, the last thing to do that I think is important is just to thank uh, School of Public Affairs um, events team, uh, Chanel Ashman, Charles Leggett in particular, also to thank Danielle Wagner for her help with organizing this series and to help uh, Sabiha to thank Sabiha Afrin and Che Rao for their promotion of, of this series of events. So thank you all. And I guess um, I'd, I'd like, to, as questions are coming in, I wonder if I could exercise the moderator's prerogative and I think try and, and pose a few questions. Uh, I, several come out that I'd like to ask. Uh, I think the, the first one is that all three of the speakers touched to some extent on US subnational efforts which I think are important because on the one hand, they, they allay fears about inconsistency by showing that at least you know, California and Massachusetts, uh, according to Dan's uh, demonstration, 
are you know consistent and and solid as you know mitigators and performers in the sort of Paris sense of the word in reducing emissions over time. So that on the one hand, they they can help give credibility where at the national level sometimes it doesn't exist. On the other hand, I mean as as I've argued and 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 you know we've we've had discussions about whether or not going to the subnational level is a good way to uh, sort of consider mitigation because it somehow excuses poor national level performance. If we say, well, at the national level is not so good, but let's look at some of the states that are doing good things. I mean, I guess I guess I just wonder how we walk the line on making sure we consider subnational efforts, but also considering that, as Dan mentioned, they are also veto points, and that you know, as I think all three speakers mentioned, I mean, the veto points such as the Supreme Court, such as the Congress, and such as even how you know the, as the Chevron Doctrine, how how executive policies are considered and implemented and questioned, I think are all uh, they're all in flux depending on which party is running the country formally and informally. And I think Dan made a convincing argument that we may be, and everyone, all of us who, who study politics see that things aren't boding well uh, for the Biden administration and for the Democrats in the midterms. So it seems the question, a second question, be, you know, the first one being the sort of sub the role of subnational analysis. The second one being, you know, how can we go forward nationally, even if the inconsistency and the pendulum swing goes back in the midterms in a hard way to the Republicans, who include a majority at this point of climate deniers? You know, how do we hold, how do we save face internationally and continue mitigating? Are there, are there ways at the national level to do that? And I think a third provocation comes from the question, you know, it's great that Intel has net neutrality by 2040. Uh, it seems it, indeed that a lot of companies are moving in that direction and that a lot of it does involve offsets, which some people question as, you know, true emissions reduction, because what you're doing is really, uh, you're sort of uh, reallocating emissions on a ledger sheet, right? I mean, it, it's not as if you're reducing emissions in an absolute way. But the question is, how can the private sector uh, continue to be pressured into, I mean, not to say that Intel was pressured necessarily, although public opinion is moving in that direction, but how do we, how do we ensure that the private sector does its part without leaning on the private sector to do the work of government, which sometimes is not being done, right? And so, I, I mean, I think those are three questions to start out with. Uh, and I, you know, would really, we would encourage people to submit questions to the Q&A area. Thanks. Todd, can I uh, take a first crack at at least two of your questions? Sure, please. Um, the, the first is, um, um, I, don't, I don't think pointing out that there's progress at the subnational level, at least from my perspective, is, is not an excuse for not, lack of performance at the federal level. You get your reductions where you get your reductions. And the problem I found in working in Europe, um, you know, and, and sitting down, for example, in front of a European Commission official, not talking about climate, but having to listen back in the George W. Bush days to a 20 man harangue about how shitty uh, US climate policy is. Um, you know, I've been through that exercise. And you turn to the person and you say, well, it, it turns out there is a lot happening. You just don't understand the political complications of how we govern ourselves in the United States, where it's not all at the na national level. And so it is what it is. I think um, in the renewables area, there actually has been a lot of activity in states that are fairly, fairly seriously red because of the job implications. The other thing I would say is I fundamentally disagree with your characterization of offsets. But before I explain that, I want to make clear Intel's objective is to minimize uh, the use of offsets in reaching our target. Um, and we're certainly not going to go out and, and, and plant trees. 
which you know I view as a ridiculous. I mean, we ought to plant trees for a lot of reasons, but not to mitigate climate change. Uh, offsets, it's not just moving numbers around on a, on a balance sheet. If the offsets are validated and they're real, they do reduce emissions. They just don't reduce emissions here rather than there. And the final thing is for many corporations, if you look at the science-based targets initiative, where a lot of companies have committed to, to net zero, almost none of them are manufacturing companies. They're consumer facing retail service oriented organizations that don't have real emissions, you know, or have relatively small emissions because they don't make anything. There are very few manufacturing companies in that program today because the only way for a manufacturer to get to net zero is to go out of business unless they have offsets. And going out of business is, you know, no company is going to choose that as its climate uh, strategy. So I, I think offsets. Uh, although, again, we want to minimize the use of offsets. I think offsets can be too easily dismissed. Okay. Thank you very much. Good points. Okay. Others? Anybody else like to respond or perhaps? Oh, Dorothy. Oh, okay. Dorothy is. Can, yeah. Can I just jump in with a couple quick um, reactions? Uh, so, Todd, in thinking through sort of your initial premise of, you know, focusing so much on state level action, is that um, excusing federal level action, inaction? I, I mean, I, I, if the federal government were to firmly swing and land on the side of being able to pass um, climate mitigation legislation, Subnational governments would matter anyway because of the way we devolve and, and um, need state and local governments to implement federal policies. So I think it's really important to be looking at subnational governments in and of themselves. Um, and actually, just in terms of thinking through your other issue in, of what might move the private sector. Um, Yesterday, I was giving a talk at the University of Wisconsin on health equity and climate change. And one of the striking things that I think is happening with respect to uh, climate change across the country, and that will continue to happen, is it, it, it is going to become much more difficult to get the kind of insurance you need to operate in mm -hmm. climate conditions. And so I think there's a range of things that can be sort of churning at a level that are, uh, is hard to see, but I think insurance mm -hmm. in the face of extreme and frequent extreme events will make companies act differently. Um, to, to insulate themselves from risk. And that may have climate consequences. And in fact, I mean, I think that we should try and make it easy uh, to have those climate consequences be positive. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll add something on the, the national. I mean, I think as uh, was it the Rhodium report says, no one level of government alone can deliver on the target. I think that is absolutely the case. Um, and you know, there are things the federal government has to do, sponsor a lot of the basic research and technology development, maybe establish a national clean energy standard that sort of a renewable standard that applies generally and, and sets a floor for states, maybe, um, having some sort of carbon pricing. The, the problem is that um, a small number of states are, are being pretty active on the mitigation side and we'll see on the adaptation side, but a lot of other states are not <laughs> and are moving right. um, in, in the other direction. And that reflects very much the, the, the presidential vote and who's running um, the governing coalition in these different states. So I think it's important to look at what's happening at the subnational level, but that certainly does not excuse the lack of action at the national level. And thus um, my point about inconsistency. And I think, I think it was Dorothy that mentioned that um, you could look across a range of issues 
and find states really pretty strongly clustered. I mean, it could be healthcare, it could be abortion, it could be <laughs> critical race theory. I don't know. You could probably draw up a list and you would find some pretty strong clusters so that you can almost predict. Um, we did a couple of years ago, did with a couple of students, we just looked at the um, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economies ratings of state energy efficiency policies. So energy efficiency, that saves money. That should be a pretty neutral sort of good government thing. It was very, very strongly correlated with um, state ideology and, and partisanship. So there, there are these really strong clusters. And I agree with Steve that in some ways we're still a centrist country, but it looks very much like the extremes are sort of driving the, the policy making. And I, there are probably a variety of reasons for that. So um, yeah, those are some thoughts on some of those points. Well, Dan, one, one thing that occurs to me is, and, and this, I don't want to sound, I don't want this to sound uh, super naive, but again, I think one of the problems that, that climate advocates have created is it's not a problem they've created, but a strategic error is emphasizing the negative and not the positive. Yeah. Um, I think that there are huge, huge economic upsides to, to smart climate policy, particularly in the renewables and energy efficiency space. And, and groups like ECEEE are pointing that out and it's a mm -hmm. tough slog, it's an uphill climb. You know, people aren't going to say, oh I, oh, I hear you for the first time. Yeah, of course I agree. You're going to have to tell a story and show examples, but I know Bill Ritter, former governor of Colorado, um, who I've worked with on a variety of things um, in the nonprofit world. He runs a center at Colorado State University, the Center for the New Energy Economy, I think it's called. And he's worked with governors in a number of states, including a number of red states, on the uh, jobs opportunities associated with uh, renewable energy. And there's some good examples that he cites, and I don't recall off the top of my head which states they are, but they're in the Midwest, where you get two red states vying to, you know, who's going who's gonna to have more solar energy than, than the yeah. next. And because they see that there's job opportunities. And, you know, that's not a magic bullet, but, you know, the mitigation side has opportunities. It's not all about, you know, having to eat artificial meat. <laughs> yeah, no, th thanks. I, I agree. I'm a, a strong advocate of a sort of green economy framing of these issues where you, um, I mean, renewable energy generates more employment. It saves money. It improves public health. Um, you could even set aside all the sort of climate greenhouse gas emission arguments and make a pr pretty strong case for that. And a, and a lot of, I mean, the state with the highest proportion of renewable or wind generated electricity is I think Iowa now. Um, and so they're doing it because it makes economic and, and health sense to do it that way. So yeah, I'd say build on, on, on those um, arguments. Right. Like, All right, let me, let me throw a little red meat out uh, after the discussion of the artificial meat, which is just a question from <laughs> Our audience member, uh, Johan Chu, who talks about maglev technology, which is the where trains glide above the tracks, right? The high high speed rails in uh, Japan, uh, Germany have have adopted this infrastructure. And the question is, why can't the United States invest in the, in this technology for a better and cleaner future? Is it because of automobile lobbyists, or is it because people don't know this technology and infrastructure? Um, anyway. Uh, and one question, another one uh, from Linda, it seems that individuals still have the freedom to create change through ideas like those presented uh, by Doug Douglas Talame and the NWF. Do you have any ideas to support this, this type of, of change? Uh, okay, I throw those, those two questions out. Well, I will say on maglev that when I was in college in the mid 70s, and for a couple of years I was on the college debate team, the national debate topic for that year was 
resolved that the federal government should have a national energy policy. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> yeah. this is like 1974. So these issues have been around. And I remember one of the subtopics that people used to argue about is, is maglev. So the question of why maglev hasn't materialized um, in all those years is one I don't have the answer to. Um, but it does, you know, it, it does bring up um, the question of whether real mitigation of climate change is going to be, you know, renewable energy and energy efficiency and a lot of the things that are already out there and how much of it is going to be due to sort of big ticket uh, projects, whether it's uh, maglev or whether it's, um, you know, um, carbon capture and storage or direct capture. Um, you know, I there's a lot of money that could be invested in maglev that probably could have more immediate effects um, in being invested in more traditional things like renewables. Just my thought. And I think you, you, with respect to that kind of infrastructure investment, you also at least have to acknowledge um, the expanse of the geography of the United States. So the mm -hmm. comparison with Japan and Germany with geography is a big difference with China. Okay, so that's also a substantial geography, but a very different political system. So, I mean, the California experience with trying to um, invest in high-speed rail is, I think, a cautionary tale of how Americans feel about their government, right? It's slow going, full of a lot of distrust and very difficult decision-making. Um, just to circle back to a point that um, Dan made earlier, uh, and, and Stephen too, on um, you know, it is is the is the American consensus on climate change, you know, divided or more central? And I it, it made me think of um, of the scholarship actually coming out of um, one of. Dan, one of your colleagues, Jan Laley, and the book, Who Votes Now? Um, and so, so sort of thinking through broad American public opinion and who participates in the political system, are, those are two different things and there's some real patterns to that. Yeah. So I think we, we, we have some challenges with, um, you know, what our preferences might be for things like maybe different infrastructure, uh, more efficient infrastructure, and then whether or not we all collectively show up to continue to demand that and press it at the polls and elsewhere. Great. Um, I, Linda clarifies her previous question, um, but I think, I think the broader question that she suggests is, you know, what role can individuals still play in this? Is there a place for each of us to do something in the U.S.? Or, you know, frankly, is the problem too big for, for individuals? I, I think that's kind of the question she's heading at. I mean, yeah, there, there are things individuals can do. Um, not, you know, use public transit. Um, drive an electric vehicle, um, eat less meat, um, and so on. But if you, if, if you look at sort of the actual behavioral change, that can only get you so far. I mean, if you're still generating a lot of electricity with coal and natural gas, or if you're, you're still relying on oil for you know 98% <laughs> of um, transportation, um, that those are things that an individual behavior can change. So yeah, people can individually make a difference and, and should do that, but the, the systems have to change. At least that, that's my conclusion. Thanks. All right, anyone else or any last words? We're, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, yeah. We've covered a lot of ground. I, I would just say that, um... And, and maybe I'm overly pessimistic. I, I think people should do what they can do consistent with, you know, their needs, their family needs, et cetera, which varies, you know, where do you live relative to where you work and, 
you know, what options do you have at your disposal, which is going to vary from person to person. But, you know, in general, I think two things. One, Dan is right. This is going to require, I think, as Dan made the point very early on, this is about a transformation of the energy system. That's what climate change is about. And it's about other things as well, but they're on the margin. The other thing is, I, I just don't believe that masses of people are going to change their personal habits fundamentally on things like, do I eat meat or not, um, uh, because of climate change. And if we're dependent upon you know, the additive value of all these individual behavioral changes to make a difference uh, in the big scheme of things, I, I think we, we shouldn't hold our breath. But again, it, it, make, it can make a contribution. And for people who feel like they, they want to have a sense of personal responsibility, I think that's worth it in and of itself. Great. Any further comments? Yeah, I, I'll just I, throw in, uh, Steve alluded to this and, and Dorothy may have as well, that um, a lot of the problems in dealing with climate change really sort of get at the state of our political system. And a, a big issue is just low confidence and low trust in government and also um, low social trust, trust in other people who you don't know personally. And um, it's, it's very hard to get agreement on goals uh, and agreement just on evidence <laughs> and science um, when you have those levels of, of distrust. So I think that's a, that's a big issue. Okay, great. Uh, Dorothy, did you wanna uh, make a final comment? Well, I, I was... Um in terms of sort of what people can do, I think um, not, not to be too Pollyanna, um, but I, I think being engaged is a responsibility. And so understanding what your local government does, what your state government does and, and asking for what you want. I do this all the time in Kansas, <laughs> not successful, <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, being clear about what I'd like my my state representatives um, and my my federal representatives to to act on, um, you know, I'm much more successful at the local level. But this is sort of a blue dot inside of a red state, and it's um, to Stephen's point, how we frame this really matters. And I, I agree fundamentally that framing this as a catastrophe is paralyzing. You know, so when when um, when the Lancet report came out on climate and health, uh, initially they were like, "This is a great opportunity. Um, that we need we need change, and we're good. change is going to come. So let's try and think about how we change in in ways that are as consensual as as we can understand them to be an equity equity based. That's not easy." Um, so again, not to be too Pollyanna, but I think something people can do is remain engaged. All right. Well, thank you. And, and I guess unless you have any more comments, um, we'll, we'll end on that note of, of trying to help you stay engaged with, again, some upcoming webinars, including one on May 12th about carbon pricing and sort of who, who can pay for, uh, you know, actions but indeed, as was pointed out, a good part of this problem is changing, changing the energy mix, right? So I think that's, that's probably a webinar we need in the future. So I think we're getting an agenda for, for our next series of webinars. And we're gonna present a few more hard cases, which perhaps make the US look less inconsistent, which is uh, Australia and Brazil. We'll be presenting those on, on May 16th. And so, you know, the US is, is not doing as well as perhaps many hope at the national level. At the subnational level, there's there are plenty of signs for, you know, of of some of progress and and some optimism. But um, but thank you so much for your comments today and for your presentation. And I guess we'll we'll sign off and thank you again and hope to see you all next time at uh, our first uh, our first webinar uh, in May will be May 10th on adaptation and the global adaptation regime. Again, thank you. 
and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.